As freer trade flourished this decade, the Internet evolved into a commercial phenomenon. Open markets and the deluge of real-time information have unleashed cutthroat competition, keeping inflation under wraps. Those bubbles, they're disruptive, but they seem to be an inevitable product of fundamental innovation. At the end of it, you are left with a more productive economy. You know, historians will look back and say, we were right to think the Internet was an extraordinary thing. It did change the world, even if a lot of the companies that were floating were fraudulent and the bubble went crazy. That was the biggest stock market bubble, certainly in the history of the United States and perhaps even the UK. It transformed uh, the world in, in a very big way. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has approved a revised draft of a policy document on the new world order. The Pentagon is backing off a controversial earlier draft and has abandoned a one superpower strategy. This would have had the U.S. aim to contain rivals for leadership such as Japan and Germany. The final document puts more emphasis on international alliances and organizations. In 1996, a group of neocons wrote a report intended as advice for incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It called for a clean break with the peace process, rolling back Syria and removing Saddam Hussein from power, an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. Amongst those who contributed, Richard Pearl, Douglas Fife, now number three at the Pentagon, David Wormser, now in the State Department, and Meirav Wormser. It was no more than a mental exercise done in a think tank um, uh, by a group of people. Um, yes, many of us are Jewish. There's no need to apologize for that. Um, uh, most of us, all of us, in fact, are pro-Israel. Uh, some of us more fiercely so than, the, than, than others. But we have no problem also criticizing Israel. That, that paper in 1996, the, the Clean Break paper, that was the paper that led to accusations of, of dual loyalty. There is no dual loyalty. In 1998, the project for the new American century wrote to President Clinton, urging removing Saddam's regime from power. Eighteen people signed, half now in the administration, including Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and his influential deputy, Paul Wolfowitz. The U.S. Department of Defense is the neoconservative stronghold. Paul Wolfowitz, the number two there, and fellow neocon Douglas Fife, the number three. At the more dovish State Department, neocon John Bolton is in charge of arms control. At the National Security Council, there's Elliot Abrams, the president's Near East advisor. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and Vice President Dick Cheney are not neocon intellectuals, perhaps, but certainly political allies. Some leading neocons, people whisper, are strongly pro-Zionist and want to topple regimes in the Middle East to help Israel as well as the US. In Washington, this is a highly sensitive issue. It was Elliot Cohen who gave this neocon campaign a name. He sees the Cold War against communism as World War III and the conflict with what he calls militant Islam as World War IV. And so I said World War IV is somewhat tongue-in-cheek but it, as a way of capturing the fact that, uh, I mean, I believe we are locked in a long-term war with the radicalized branches of Islam. Professor Cohen's old pal and college dean was Paul Wolfowitz. The Deputy Defense Secretary is the man who brought neocon philosophy into the heart of the U.S. administration, a philosophy of exporting democracy in the interests of defending America. 
we will make a lot of people very nervous. And we will hear, for example, the Mubarak regime in Egypt or the Saudi royal family thinking about this idea that these Americans are spreading of democracy in this part of the world. They will say, you make us very nervous. And our response should be good. Um, you could say that our power is a figment of our enemy's imagination. It might be absolutely true. Uh, we are not claiming to be running the world. Uh, our job is just to think. And if our ideas get adopted, and if our ideas turn into policy, wonderful. That's what we're here for. The Department of Defense is developing the Joint Precision Approach and Landing System, or JPALS. JPALS augments GPS to provide precision approach and landing information for military aircraft flying in poor weather or low visibility for virtually any mission. The system consists of both ground and airborne components. The ground system transmits corrections to participating aircraft which enhance the accuracy of the airborne GPS position. The ground system also transmits a set of coordinate data defining the final approach path. The airborne JPALS receiver determines the aircraft position relative to the desired approach path. That information is presented to the pilots on their primary flight instruments and can also be used by the autopilot to fly automated approaches. It's just 45 miles north of the Las Vegas Strip, on the edge of the Mojave Desert. This is Creech Air Force Base, home to the only wing in the Air Force where none of the pilots ever leave the ground. This is a new way to wage war. Colonel Chris Chambliss was one of the top F-16 fighter pilots in the Air Force, a member of the legendary Thunderbirds. Now the unit he commands has no jets, just these pilotless planes, known as the Reaper and the Predator. This is the first base in Air Force history that exclusively flies unmanned aircraft. The trigger is pulled in Nevada, 
inside these cramped single-wide trailers and small offices. 250 pilots work in shifts around the clock. Alongside each one of them is a crew member who operates the plane's onboard camera and a behind-the-scenes team of intelligence analysts. And crews here take control by satellite once the aircraft is several thousand feet in the air. All the screens that you see are secret. The Air Force declassified these pictures for our report. What you see here is the pilot's real-time view of the battlefield from thousands of feet in the air, being beamed back live from cameras mounted on the unmanned planes. It's what the soldiers on the ground call their eyes in the sky. Yet military history is full of surprises, even if few are as dramatic or as memorable as Pearl Harbor. Surprise happens so often that it's surprising that we're still surprised by it. Very few of these surprises are the product of simple blindness or simple stupidity. Almost always there have been warnings and signals that have been missed, sometimes because there were just too many warnings to pick the right one out. scenario that it has to do with airline counterterrorism. Why is that important enough to kill for? Because it's no longer a game. But if some terrorist group wants to act out this scenario, why target you for assassination? Depends on who your terrorists are. The men who conceived of it in the first place. You're saying our government plans to commit a terrorist act against a domestic airline. There you go. Dating the entire government, as usual. It's a faction. A small faction. For what possible gain? The Cold War's over, John. But with no clear enemy to stockpile against, the arms market's flat. But bring down a fully loaded 727 into the middle of New York City, and you'll find a dozen tin pot dictators all over the world just clamoring to take responsibility and begging to be smart bombed. I can't believe it. Th this is about increasing arms sales. Mm -hmm. When? Tonight. What the heck's that? Is that what it looks like? I think it is what it looks like. What does what look like? Modem protocol. 
Remote access. Somebody on the ground's flying your plane. Bogey, sir. Keep your course. We need to know our flight plan. I'm mapping the data now. Liars. Your flight's gonna make an unscheduled stop in exactly 22 minutes. The corner of Liberty and Washington. Lower Manhattan. World Trade Center. I'm gonna crash the plane into the World Trade Center. I'll tell the flight crew. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD for short, has been defending the skies over the U.S. and Canada for almost 50 years, 46 to be precise. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion, with a T. That's $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. To understand how the Pentagon can lose track of trillions, consider the case of one military accountant. Who tried to find out what happened to a mere 300 million. We know it's gone, but we don't know what they spent it on. Jim Minnery, a former Marine turned whistleblower, is risking his job by speaking out for the first time about the millions he noticed were missing from one defense agency's balance sheets. Minnery tried to follow the money trail, even crisscrossing the country looking for records. The director looked at me and he says, why do you care about this stuff? <laughs> It took me aback, you know. My supervisor asked me why I care about doing a good job. So. He was reassigned and says officials then covered up the problem by just writing it off. They got to cover it up. That's where the corruption comes in. They've got to cover up the fact that they can't do the job. The Pentagon's inspector general partially substantiated several of Minnery's allegations, but could not prove officials tried to manipulate the financial statements. Twenty years ago, Pentagon employee Franklin C. Spinney made headlines exposing what he calls the accounting games. He's still there, and although he does not speak for the Pentagon, he believes the problem has gotten worse. Those numbers are pie in the sky. The books are cooked routinely year after year after year. Retired Vice Admiral Jack Shanahan commanded the Navy's second fleet the first time Donald Rumsfeld served as defense secretary. With good o financial oversight, we could find $48 billion in loose change in that building without having to hit the taxpayers. In the two and a half minutes since this report began, the Pentagon has spent nearly $2 million, and it may never know where 25% of those tax dollars went. This morning, we go inside the secure basement bunker where the U.S. government monitors global financial conditions for any signs of incoming uh, threats. CNBC's Eamon Javers joins us uh, from the Treasury's Markets Room. And you're there right now, right, Eamon? 
That's right, Joe. Good morning to you. Well, if there is a NORAD of American finance, this is it. This is Treasury's markets room, and these staffers behind me have been monitoring situations around the world in financial markets overnight. That's what they do every day here at the markets room. It's interesting because, Joe, the Treasury is a gorgeous building, but the markets room here is in the basement, and you have to go down sort of a, a sort of a castle-like dungeon stairwell to get down here. It's a secure facility, but this is not a classified facility. The distinction is you don't have to have a top-secret clearance to be in here, which is why I'm allowed to be standing here right now. The tapes are from NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, and they contain the voices of personnel at our nation's Northeast Air Sector, a defense sector, NEADS, NEADS, located in Rome, New York. NEADS' mission was to protect a half million square mile of airspace on the East Coast. When you listen, keep this in mind, NEADS personnel were expecting an exercise that day. Major Kevin Nasapani, the facility's commander, was among them. All right, Boston Center, Team U. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New, New York, and we need you guys to. We need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise, not a test. For seven years, 37-year-old Philip Morelli was a construction worker inside the Trade Center. The Queens native says he loved his job at the Twin Towers. And there was always construction going on in the World Trade Center. There's a lot of floors. Between the two buildings, there was 110, so that's 220. And then you had nine floors in building four, five, and six. So there was always something going on, and we were always there. At 8.30, he says he was headed to level B4 in Tower 1, four stories below ground. I go downstairs, the foreman tells me to go to remove the containers as I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor. That's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion of whatever happened it threw me to the floor and that's when everything started happening. I think a bomb went off in the lobby first, then a plane hit the building, but then another plane hit the other building. And But when I was coming through the doors on the other side of the Trade Center, something, either they blew the lobby up or, or something, because it blew the glass out of the doors and knocked the sword down, and I got a uh, smoke and everything on me. Pfeiffer was the first chief into the building. Right away, a guy from the Port Authority told him the damage was somewhere above the 78th floor. But all you had to do was look around. It was obvious. Something had happened right there in the lobby. These twin sisters, visiting from Alabama and Georgia, met in New York to share their 40th birthday. They were having coffee in the World Trade Center when the first plane struck. And all of a sudden it sounded like, I don't know where the subway is, but it sounded like a subway collision, a bomb. And it, it, it was just pounding, boom, boom, boom. And I, I literally thought the subway had exploded and, and all the cars were pissing land on top of us. One of the reasons you, you may, may notice that we're not really talking back to our reporters the way we normally would in getting, uh, and, you know, getting their rundown on what's going on is because our communications with most of them have uh, been uh, knocked out knocked out by the fact that there are communication devices are on the World Trade Numerous Center. Numerous antennas on the World Trade Center. In fact, all the TV stations here in New York but one had personnel uh, full-time there at the top of the World Trade Center. And, of course, uh, one of our concerns here in the station, as it is uh, at all the other stations, is the status uh, of those people.
one of the eeriest moments amid the carnage of 9-11. A mysterious plane was seen flying right over the president's residence. Even some CNN staffers saw it. To this day, it has never been officially explained. Tonight, Chief National Correspondent John King has new details about this great 9-11 mystery. About 10 minutes ago, there was a white jet circling overhead. Now, you generally don't see planes in the area over the White House. That is restricted airspace. And still today, no one will offer an official explanation of what we saw. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft and say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. Note the flag on the tail, the stripe around the fuselage, and the telltale bubble just behind the 747 cockpit area. There are many commercial uh, versions of the 747, obviously, that look similar, but I don't know any of them that have the communications pod like the E-4, uh, the Air Force E-4 does behind the cockpit. The distinctive hump, called a ray dome, houses some of the 67 different satellite dishes and antennas on the outside of the plane. The E-4B has dozens of different means of communication, from open to encrypted, low frequency to high. It has everything from voice over IP to teletypes, a technology first introduced in 1924. There is nothing more chilling than the sight of an airliner exploding. But NASA and the FAA believe in order to prevent an accidental disaster, you have to create an intentional one. In the name of science, the two agencies teamed up to demolish a Boeing 720. The goal is to gather crucial information that will lead to safer air travel. To make sure that the test is comprehensive as possible, they set up a runway to ensure total devastation. Pilots, via remote control, take the unmanned plane up to 2,300 feet and then bring it in for a crash landing. It's obvious there's no intention of lowering the landing gear. Looked like it had dynamite in it. The ball of fire that came flying out of that one was even worse than the first one. And we were standing there and I said, I can't believe this. And sure enough, there it was, another plane. The plane wasn't no uh, airline or anything. It was a twin-engine, big, gray plane. Mark Burnback, a Fox employee, is on the phone with us. Uh, Mark uh, witnessed this from what we understand. Mark, were you close enough to be able to see any markings on, on the airplane? Uh, hi, gentlemen. How you doing? Yeah, there was, um, there was definitely a blue logo. It was like a circular logo on the front of the plane, uh, towards the, uh, yeah, definitely towards the front. Um, it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the sides. It just flew straight into it. There's not, it didn't look like it was... Uh... And it didn't look like a commercial jet. It was a smaller plane. It was definitely a smaller plane. Jim, what you're saying uh, could, could be a drone aircraft. That's an aircraft that's uh, uh, guided electronically uh, to its target without having a pilot. Now, that is a possibility as well. When the towers fell, underneath the area near and just there at Ground Zero were, were really telephone bunkers. Verizon's building was there. All of that was damaged. In fact, 200,000 phone lines in just this area alone, nothing. None of these phones worked. So could trades get through? And of course, it was just minutes before the New York Stock Exchange was going to open, and the decision had to be made. 
can it open? Is it possible to effectuate trades at that time? Well, the man who had to help really make the decision and announce it to the world is with me now. He's Harvey Pitt, former head of the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. Reach back to that day, Harvey. Uh, you only had a few minutes to make the decision. What was it like? Uh, it was mind-boggling. Uh, we thought, uh, you know, that this was of a magnitude we couldn't understand, but we got in touch with all the exchanges. Dick Grasso and I uh, uh, started talking early in the morning. and he Dick, said, of course, running the New York Stock Exchange yes. at the time. And he said I was the last person he spoke to before he went to sleep. So uh, we were in touch with all the exchanges trying to figure out what they could do and couldn't do, and that's why we came up here the very next day. Well, none of the phones were working, no. and again, you're talking 200,000 phone lines, and people have to get information through the phone lines, but also 3.6 million data circuits as well not functioning properly. What was the final straw that broke the camel's back where you said, I hate to do it, but we can't open these markets? There were 80% of the uh, phone lines were down, and we were just concerned that investors were going to pay a very heavy price and that our capital markets might well wind up being ruined because of that. So we shut it down as quickly as we could, and then the question was when we would reopen, and I uh, ultimately decided we shouldn't reopen until the following Monday so that we had a chance to test the new lines, the new electrical wiring and so on uh, without real orders being at stake. NBC News now has learned the administration did have a plan in the works to go after Osama bin Laden and the Al Qaeda network, and that plan was on the president's desk the weekend before 911. NBC Jim McLeshevsky has more on all of this tonight. Jim, what's the latest there? Well, Tom, U.S. and foreign sources tell NBC News that only two days before 9-11, President Bush was given what amounted to a detailed war plan for an all-out war against al-Qaeda network worldwide. It was a formal national security presidential directive, which one U.S. official called the game plan to wipe al-Qaeda from the face of the earth. The extensive plan reportedly dealt with all aspects of a war against al-Qaeda, everything from diplomacy to military operations. First, convincing other countries to cooperate, share intelligence, use their own law enforcement agencies to round up al-Qaeda suspects. It included covert 
U.S. operations to disrupt al-Qaeda cells in 60 countries. The directive also had plans to freeze al-Qaeda bank accounts and to disrupt al-Qaeda money laundering. The terrorist directive commands them to kill Christians and Jews, to kill all Americans, and make no distinctions among military and civilians, including women and children. This group and its leader, a person named Osama bin Laden, are linked to many other organizations in different countries, including the Egyptian Islamic Jihad and the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. There are thousands of these terrorists in more than 60 countries. They are recruited from their own nations and neighborhoods and brought to camps in places like Afghanistan, where they are trained in the tactics of terror. They are sent back to their homes or sent to hide in countries around the world to plot evil and destruction. The leadership of al-Qaeda has great influence in Afghanistan and supports the Taliban regime in controlling most of that country. In Afghanistan, we see al-Qaeda's vision for the world. Afghanistan's people have been brutalized. Many are starving, and many have fled. Now, when you think of the Afghan economy, what comes to mind well, besides opium production and narcotics trafficking? Well, according to the United States and also Afghan officials, Afghanistan could eventually become one of the most important mining centers in the world. Now, this after a story in the New York Times says that the United States has discovered nearly one trillion dollars worth of mineral deposits in the war-torn nation. But are these findings really new information or did other nations including the United States, know about this for years. And also, what could the recent reports mean for the future of Afghanistan? Well, joining me with more investigative journalist Webster Tarpley. Uh, so, Webster, you know, the headlines here, at least in the New York Times piece, read that, you know, this discovery goes far beyond any previously known reserves. But even in that New York Times article, they go on to say that, you know, there were these charts, this documentation that was there for decades, starting with the Soviets there, right. you know, in the 80s, and then geologists back there in 2004, again in 2006, in 2007, apparently more reports were published. They say it sort of collected dust. They sat on this for a few years. So talk about the timing here. I mean, why did this article come out now? Well, as, as you correctly say, there's nothing new here. Uh, they have discovered nothing. The discoveries, if there were some, were made by the Soviets during the 1980s. There's a World Bank report from 2004 that has all of this stuff. At the time of Karzai coming here to Washington about a month ago with Hillary Clinton meeting, there was a bunch of talk about the mineral wealth of Afghanistan. So uh, it's a very important thing, but it's not new. The story of one of the worst economic crises in American history begins on the day after September 11, 2001. That's when Alan Greenspan, chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, flew over the southern tip of Manhattan Island. The U.S. economy was already in recession, and as he surveyed the horror of 9-11, Greenspan feared economic collapse. I was very much concerned that we were in the throes of something we had never seen before. History had told us that that type of shock to an economy tends to unwind it, because remember, economies are people meeting with each other. What that did is it froze everyone in place. 
On Business Center, Friday, October 12, 2001, the nation holds its breath as the possibility of more terrorist attacks on the United States dominates the news and the market. The financial institutions of our country face a difficult time for their business as they get back to that business. The government reported retail sales plunged 2.4 percent, well below forecast. Of Money the- continues to disappear from investors by the billions. Today, the sell-off continues, the Dow plunging to lows not seen in two years. The outlook was bleak. The economy was still reeling from the dot-com bust. And what the country needed was for Americans to start spending. Alan Greenspan made that easier. As Fed chairman, he controlled the country's short-term interest rates. The lower the interest rate, the cheaper it was for people to borrow money. Five days after viewing the devastation at Ground Zero, Greenspan began a series of sharp cuts in interest rates. Meanwhile, the president went on television, exhorting Americans to keep the economy afloat and go out and shop. We cannot let the terrorists achieve the objective of of frightening our nation to the point where uh, where we don't conduct business. I do believe in the American dream. I believe there is such a thing as the American dream. And I believe those of us who have been given positions of responsibility must must, uh, do everything we can to spotlight the dream and to make sure the dream shines in all neighborhoods, all throughout our country. Owning a home is a part of that dream. It just is. Right here in America, if you own your own home, uh, you're realizing the American dream. And so here are some of the... uh, some of the ways to address the issue. First, the single greatest barrier to first-time home ownership is a high down payment. It is really hard for many, many low-income families to make the high down payment. And so that's why I've proposed and urged Congress to fully fund the American Dream Down Payment Fund. This will use uh, money, taxpayers' money, Uh, to help a qualified low-income buyer make a down payment. And that's important. If one of the barriers to home ownership is the inability to make a down payment, and if one of the goals is to increase home ownership, it makes sense to help people pay that down payment. First of all, government-sponsored corporations that help create our mortgage system. I introduced two of the leaders here today. They call those people Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as well as the federal home loan banks, will increase their commitment to minority markets by more than $440 billion. There's a lot of fine print on these forms. And uh, it bothers people. It makes them nervous. And so therefore, What Mel has agreed to do and Alfonso Jackson have agreed to do is to streamline uh, the process, make the rules simpler so everybody understands what they are, make the closing much less complicated. We certainly don't want there to be a fine print preventing people from owning their home. We can change the print. With the layoffs and foreclosures spiraling out of control, the suffering is increasing each day. Where are you going to go now? I don't know. There are allegations that some captains of the financial industry knew all along a collapse was inevitable, but still continued to take advantage of the profits. Now, as taxpayers are funding a massive bailout, the public is demanding accountability. I think the entire industry to share some of that responsibility, and for that we are sorry for it. But regardless of whether they made millions, was there anyone in the financial world who could answer the question, what was everybody thinking? It turns out there was. 
Did you see this coming? Yes. Karen Weaver is one of the top analysts at Deutsche Bank, a major player in the mortgage investment business. She says in April 2005, she left the confines of Wall Street and traveled to California to get some answers. She's now credited as being one of the first to figure out what was behind all those mortgages. It was the first peek behind the green curtain, if you will, sort of, to uh, how these mortgages are being underwritten. Her mission? To meet in person with the people approving the loans that were being folded into investments. What she found stunned her. Underwriters who did not seem worried about issuing risky loans. What was disconcerting was it meant that they weren't really vouching for the fact that they were creating a loan that they felt was creditworthy. She says some underwriters reasoned that before a loan defaulted, a borrower could just refinance and pay it off with yet another risky loan. They were saying that essentially the problem was going to roll off down the line. So it was sort of like playing a hot potato. One could argue, yes. And that risky loan is gone. He's into a different loan. And that's not our problem. That's exactly right. In other words, she believed lenders were just putting off the inevitable day of reckoning, though she didn't know just how bad it would get. So in September 2005, her group at Deutsche Bank issued this report predicting subprime mortgage losses will increase significantly and recommending that investors bet against the mortgage market. But she wasn't the only person to see what was happening. James LaLiberty was the chief operating officer at People's Choice Home Loan. He has never spoken publicly before. And how much did you buy this for? 135000 It was his company that loaned Dolores Parker Jackson nearly $300,000, even though she was basically broke. And with so many loans like that, he admits he knew a crisis was on the horizon. And he even asked Wall Street bankers about it. The answer was, well, you know, a lot of us see this problem coming. We just don't know what we're going to do. So let's just ride it as long as we can. Don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. The income has to fit. You know? And listen to what this 15-year veteran of the industry and ultimately a chief operating officer says about his own company. The reputation of the company was that it was, um, it was a fraud factory. A fraud factory. It was very spotty. And the chief appraiser once said, fraud is what we do. Fraud is what we do. Fraud is what we do. That's how we got where we are today. What is a bank, really, except a giant balance sheet? First, it must have some money of its own. Capital, it's called. You'll see it's important later. But think of it as the bank's standby money should anything go wrong. With that in place, the bank proper can be built. And that's really just two enormous columns, one of money borrowed and the other of money lent. Yes, the bank has to borrow. Borrowed from us when we put our deposits there. And the bank pays interest on that. Then, the nice side of the balance sheet, the money the bank lends, mortgages say. The bank makes money on that, it earns interest. The profit the banks make is the difference in the interest rates on the two sides. To make money, a bank somehow has to earn more on its lending than it pays out on its borrowing. Securitization had enormous potential to transform banking. Remember the old balance sheet with money borrowed and money lent and banks own bit of capital on standby for when things go wrong? Well, securitization allows the banks to borrow and lend more and then to sell off the loans to pay off some of the debts. The bank can do that repeatedly, borrowing, lending and selling off, and that's good for them. They make their money by borrowing and lending. What securitization does in principle is allow the banks the benefits of lots of lending without the risks. Why? Because if the loans go bad, that's now the problem of the guys you've sold them to. Northern Rock is the British bank that was severely damaged as a result of the U.S. subprime mortgage financial situation. Taxpayers have the right to know what their total exposure is under the Prime Minister's latest plan for Northern Rock. Because let us be clear, this is as much a rescue package for his reputation. Yeah. So if the bonds aren't paid back, and if Northern Rock fails to meet its obligations, what is the total exposure? How much? 
the, the, the loans and the bonds are secured against the assets of Northern Rock. Northern Rock has a high quality loan book, as everybody understands. And it is our intention to get the taxpayer the best deal and to get the taxpayer their money back and to make profit. The Prime Minister won't tell us how much the taxpayer is in for. It is £55 billion. He has effectively lumped every household, every household in this country with a second mortgage. You may remember a couple of years ago, Bloomberg took the unprecedented step of suing the Federal Reserve. Our case was about gaining access to information we believed should be public. Here then are the fruits of our efforts. They're the numbers the Federal Reserve said were too dangerous. Numbers that for the first time reveal the staggering sums the world's biggest banks borrowed from the Fed during the credit crisis. To get these numbers, Bloomberg fought the Fed all the way to the Supreme Court then we spent months crunching 29,000 pages of data and deciphering 18 giant spreadsheets. Here's what the Fed didn't want you to know. From August 2007 to April 2010, the central bank put $1.2 trillion of public money at risk in secret loans to financial institutions. Almost 400 companies, some of them controlled by foreign governments, borrowed at least $20 million a day from the Fed. Several needed more much more, like Morgan Stanley. The Wall Street firm was so close to going bust in September 2008 that it tapped the Fed for $107 billion, the most of all. Then there's Royal Bank of Scotland. For 661 days, almost two whole years, the British lender owed the Fed an average of $21 billion. The central bank even helped Barclays buy Lehman Brothers U.S. assets. We'll never know if the Fed was right, that releasing these numbers would have triggered a collapse of confidence in the financial system and chaos on Wall Street. All we know is the public had a right. Let's dig deeper now into those secrets of the Fed. Sarah Eisen is here to name names, the banks that borrowed the most, and even some companies that got in on the action. Sarah? Eric, $1.2 trillion of public money from the Federal Reserve at the worst of times. Let's check out where it went. Here are the banks. Morgan Stanley borrowed the most during the crisis mode, $107 billion at the peak. It's almost three times Morgan Stanley's total profits over the last decade. Citigroup, Bank of America, even Goldman Sachs, which in 2007, by the way, was the most profitable firm in Wall Street history, borrowed 69 billion dollars. Now, Morgan Stanley may have borrowed the most at the peak, which you can see right here. But actually, in the purple, you can see Citigroup borrowed for longer from the first day of the program. Citi was in debt to the Federal Reserve seven out of every 10 days from August 2007 through April 2010. Now, we also found out that companies borrowed from the Fed as well, led by General Electric, $16.1 billion, Ford, Toyota, and even Caterpillar had to borrow $360 million. Now, we calculated all of it, added all up, $1.2 trillion from the Federal Reserve, and we figured out that that represents 500 39 Olympic-sized swimming pools of $1 bills. Eric, this is more than 20 times the amount that the Fed has ever lent in history. The last big borrowing came from the Federal Reserve, September 12, 2001, right after September 11. But if you look at these numbers, that pales in comparison yes, to these, what we saw during the these crisis. These dwarf not just that program, but the other emergency programs, the ones that we know a whole lot more about, say TARP, enacted by Congress, that was public. All of this was secret. We had, as we've pointed out, we had to sue the Fed to go and get this information. It wasn't just Bloomberg. We were joined by other media companies, Fox among them, for example, because the public does have a right to know. If we can know that much about TARP and so little about this, something feels not quite right. And the Federal Reserve had said multiple times that it did not want to reveal the names. It did not want to stigmatize these banks and make them look like they were in weak positions. But here we are, the names of the Fed. And the really the two highlights here, Eric, Morgan Stanley borrowed the most during the peak of the crisis. Citigroup borrowed the longest. Well, the other thing that we talked about a little bit earlier in the show, and we really need to bring back here, is the idea that it's not just American banks. You named some of them, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, but European banks as well. In fact, 
half of the biggest borrowers from the Fed were European banks, like the Royal Bank of Scotland. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. 661 days borrowing from the Fed, an average of $21 billion, but also up on that list. UBS, Dexia, another bank still on the ropes. Hypo Real Estate, the German bank. Okay, this is, this is a staggering figure, folks. Hypo Real Estate borrowed $29 billion from the Fed. It only had 1,336 employees, so that was equivalent to $21 million right. per employee. That's a loan from the Fed to a foreign bank. It's not even to an American bank. So the Fed clearly was backstopping the global financial system. And maybe that's one of the things that they didn't want us to know. They also lent to foreign governments, which you can find all of this, by the way, on Bloomberg.com. We have a great graphic representation of how much each bank took from the Federal Reserve and foreign governments, including Korea and other governments that had to tap the Fed's loan facilities. It's an important point also that this was not just one program. This was a series of multiple programs. Citigroup who borrowed the longest, took all six programs at one time. When the stock dropped below $3, it was tapping all six of the Fed's borrowing programs. Plus the discount window. Exactly.